We're on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, just about half a mile inland, on a hill overlooking the sea. Behind me are the ruins of the ancient town of Chorazin. In the time of Jesus, Chorazin was a town very much like Capernaum. Both boasted beautiful, impressive synagogues, thriving open markets, and large Jewish communities. And yet, like Capernaum and Bethsaida nearby, Chorazim was a town that was reluctant to fully embrace the ministry of Jesus. In a stunning passage in Matthew 11, 20-24, Jesus actually condemns all three of these towns for their lack of faith in Him. When Jews were exiled from Jerusalem and Judea by Roman soldiers after a brief war in A.D. 135, many of them came north to these towns. And again in the 4th century A.D., another period of rapid growth seems to have taken place here. Chorazim continued to be a thriving, active town for another 400 years, but after the Muslim conquest in the 7th century, its population moved and was eventually abandoned. The remains that we see here today are most likely from the 4th century, but the architecture wouldn't have been all that different from what a town would have looked like in the time of Jesus. In our study today, we look at an invitation that Jesus received to have dinner with a wealthy man. They would have had their meal in a villa, just like this one. And outside here would be the courtyard. Courtyards like these were often used for social gatherings, parties. It was in social settings like these where custom, ritual often dictated people's actions and behaviors that Jesus would mix everything up with a story, a parable that turned conventional wisdom on its head. That's exactly what we see Jesus doing in our study here today. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, 
But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Chicago is one of the great cities of the United States. It's home to about 8 million people in the larger metro area. And everything is here. There's international business, there's fine arts, there's industry. This is also an international city. When my wife and I first moved here to the northwest side, we uh, uh, had a neighborhood school that had 30 languages represented among the children. This is also a very important city for Christian life in the United States. Uh, some of the most important mission agencies in America are located here in Chicago, and uh, they're also some of the greatest churches that you'll find uh, in the United States here in Chicago, as well as great Christian colleges. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's a large uh, population here in Chicago that has nothing to do with religion. In fact, if you were to come down here to the lakeshore on a Sunday morning, you would find thousands of people uh, rollerblading, riding their bikes, playing baseball, and they have no connection to religious life whatsoever. Jesus World was populated also by a wide range of people. There were even large urban centers in Galilee, uh, much like you know we have in the United States. Now, some people were faithful to the synagogue in Jesus' time, and they attended synagogue with marked regularity. They observed the Sabbath, and they followed the Jewish food laws. Uh, they said the Creed of Israel every day, and they probably attended the three great festivals of Judaism uh, annually. Personal holiness was important to them. And it's the same in Chicago. Many of the people who live in this uh, eight million member community, um, they likewise are truly religious, truly believe in God and want to be obedient to him. But there were others in Jesus' day who lived on the religious margins. They knew the temple in Jerusalem, but they only went there rarely. They knew about the synagogue, but they felt that their own worth did not qualify them for entry. And the law, it was just too hard. Now those who lived on the margin were sharply criticized by the religious leadership of Jesus' day. The Pharisees called these people Jews who make themselves Gentiles due to their lack of zeal for the law. But here's the important point, and we'll see it here in Luke 7. Jesus loved these people on the margin. First of all, we know that Jesus' reputation was widespread during his lifetime. His disciples often uh, were sent out to villages throughout Galilee, and they announced his arrival. And then what would happen is Jesus would arrive in the village, and then he would be greeted by all of the leaders of the town. Now you can see this very nicely in Luke 19 when Jesus comes to Jericho, and he has a meal in the home of Zacchaeus. The town of Jericho comes out to greet him, all of the important leaders are standing on the roadside. And then Jesus decides not to meet with all of the important religious leaders. Instead, he goes to have dinner in the home of a notorious tax collector. So here in our story, Jesus has arrived in a village and is invited to the home of the spiritual and intellectual leadership there of the village. Simon is the host of the gathering and it's exclusively made up of men. That's important, and we'll use that in a moment. The other note we have to make is that in every culture, there are rituals of greeting. Imagine if you came into my home at wintertime here in Chicago, it's really cold, you're standing on the front porch, and uh, I don't invite you in, or maybe I don't ask you for your coat. The awkward offense would have been noticeable. You would have gotten the message, you're not welcome. So in Jesus' day, likewise, there were rituals of greeting. There were three rituals that people knew, two major rituals and one minor one, uh, they were in use. 
Now, first of all, just as we shake hands in our society, so in Jesus' day, men would greet each other <clears throat> with a kiss. How someone kissed determined their social ranking. Secondly, since this was a meal where men would recline, foot washing was common. A servant would fill a bowl, then remove a guest's sandals and wash and dry their feet before they came to the table to recline. The third gesture of greeting is anointing with oil. This was a common grooming practice uh, in the first century, and it was a gift that really helped the guests feel refreshed. Scented olive oil was given to the guest and applied to his hair. Now, this is where the story becomes interesting. When Jesus enters the scene, he is not greeted. In verse 44, it says, I came into your house, Simon. You did not give me any water for my feet. You did not give me a kiss. You did not even put oil on my head. In other words, Jesus is asked to join the table with no social courtesies. This is a major offense, and it's seen by everyone who's been invited. Simon has called Jesus, whose fame was widespread, to a social gathering with the religious leadership of the village. And now, Jesus has been offended. Simon has set up Jesus for social shame. No Pharisee who liked Jesus would have ever done something like this. Now here comes the second surprise. A woman sees this blatant attempt to bring public shame to Jesus and she tries to rescue him. Now in the passage, this woman has an illicit sexual history and she has come to the table. She not only was living a life that broke the law, but she violated strong social boundaries between men and women that the entire village upheld. You see, male-female contact in Jesus' day was strictly limited to marriages. And so a woman who was publicly flirtatious, a woman who dressed without modesty, and above all, a woman who was having sexual encounters with men who were not her husband would have been judged sharply by the leadership of the village. But the story leaves out something key. Someone or something has transformed this woman. I imagine that somewhere in the previous days, this woman heard Jesus speak about the love and grace of God. Perhaps she saw him talking freely with the town tax collector. I like to imagine that. Perhaps he healed a person with leprosy. I don't know. But something in Jesus' life exhibited the truth that he taught, that God loves everyone, even those who live on the margin of society, even those people whose lives are judged to be a moral failure. Perhaps this woman met Jesus at some earlier time. Perhaps he had spoken words of grace to her personally, maybe a word of forgiveness, and renewal came to her. We'll never know the story, what happened, but we do know this. This woman has a heart that is overflowing with gratefulness to Jesus. Now, look carefully at what she does. She tries to compensate for Simon's rude behavior, and she takes a tremendous risk when she does it. She pushes into the gathering of men, she runs to the table, and there she grabs onto Jesus' legs, which are extended out away from the table. She anoints his feet with perfume, she cries and wets his feet with her tears, and then she kisses his feet repeatedly. All of this is risky, terribly risky behavior, and I can't imagine what was going through the minds of those men sitting at table with Jesus. Now Simon, who was the host of this meal, he sees this interruption by the woman and judges it. He sees this also as an opportunity to exploit Jesus. He thinks, you see, Jesus is on the horns of a dilemma. And his next move unmasks his original hostility to Jesus. Now watch this. If Jesus is a righteous man, and everyone in town seems to think so, then Jesus will expel this woman who has shown immodest conduct by touching a man she's not married to. On the other hand, Jesus has a reputation of accepting such people, showing them grace. And if he shows this woman such grace, he will publicly show his refusal to keep modest boundaries between men and women. So what is it, Jesus? 
Are you someone who shows grace or are you someone who keeps the law? Now, Simon uses some very carefully chosen language to make a critical judgment. He says, if this man were a prophet. Now, if you could read that sentence with me in Greek, you would know that it demands a negative answer. Let me retranslate it. It would sound like this. If this man were a prophet, and we know he isn't, he would expel this unrighteous woman immediately. This is an excellent place to pause and reflect on the character of Jesus. It's also a good place to stop and think about the dilemma he's in and the nature of his opponents. See, Jesus has to make a choice just as Simon has made a choice. How can he treat this woman with grace and get through to the men who are listening? How is it that he can be known both as a man who promotes the grace of God and someone who takes the law of God seriously? That's Jesus' choice. Religious leaders in Jesus' day formed societies where men, and it was always men, they sat in the evenings, they ate meals, and they discussed the important matters of village life. They also debated theology there. This story in Luke 7 brings many of these features to light. So let's take another few minutes and rebuild the scene, making a few more deeper connections. First of all, the room. We know from excavations in the first century that uh, Jews embraced what we call a courtyard living style, particularly among the more wealthy. Now, a village would be like this. A, a, a lane would run through the village and there would be a wall running along that lane, but then a gate would open and this would lead you to an inner courtyard surrounded by buildings where families had their private residences. Now, on many occasions, when public gatherings took place, the guests were brought into the courtyard to be greeted by the host, and the gate was actually left open so that everyone in the village could look inside and see the honored gathering that was now collecting. They not only could look inside, but they could walk inside, walk around the courtyard, the outer perimeter of the dinner party, and take a look and then walk back out onto the street. Believe it or not, that tradition is still alive today among Palestinian Christians who do this sort of public hosting. Now, the other thing we know is that Jews in this era adopted the Roman triclinium. Now, let me explain. This was a three-sided table shaped something like a U where guests sat around the outer edge and servants waited on them from the inner ring. So diners would recline at such tables on low cushions with their feet extended away from them. They would rest on one elbow and then reach with the other hand into uh, common bowls served to the dinner party. So the woman you see had easy access to Jesus' feet without bothering the rest of the guests. She is among that group that is on the outer perimeter walking around looking at what is happening here at the dinner. Now we also know that Jesus enters this house, comes to the dinner party, and he is not greeted. He is asked to join the table with no social courtesies. This is a major offense, and it's seen not only by those other men who are invited, but also by those who are looking on from the public. Remember, that gate has been left open, and all spectators are watching. Simon has called Jesus to an important social gathering where he ought to be welcomed. All of the intellectual leadership of the town is there and he has been offended. Simon has set up Jesus for social shame, but here on the sidelines is this woman, and she is about to enter the very center of the story. The most dramatic scene in the story is this woman's rescue. Overcome by his public shame, she refuses to let this go. She rushes to the table, she grabs onto Jesus' legs, she wets his feet with tears, she anoints his feet with perfume and dries them with her hair. All of this is subject to remarkable misunderstanding by the men who are present at table. Now, Luke describes this woman as a sinner, 
And as I mentioned earlier, we can probably guess that she had a reputation that questioned her moral uh, character in the town. In fact, almost everything she does in this story has some sexual connotation. To begin with, Jesus' world held these strict boundaries between men and women. If a woman was not married to a man, she could not talk to him, much less touch him. You can see this drama played out when Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman in John 4 at the well. The disciples return to the well and they are shocked that Jesus is alone talking with a woman. The alabaster jar that this woman has was filled with uh, expensive perfume and it's probably something that is a part of her trade. This perfume was used both as a body fragrance and as a breath scent. But in addition, when the woman lets her hair down, she is breaking a major custom in first century society. Loosened hair was considered extremely sexual in Jesus' day. To uncover her head, to free her hair, and to touch Jesus would have been scandalous. The other thing is this. Jesus does not do the one thing that every man at the table expects he ought to do if he is truly a righteous man of Israel. He does not reject the woman. He does not push her away with his feet. And because Jesus is refusing to enforce the boundaries between men and women, Simon thinks this disqualifies Jesus as a great rabbi or prophet. Jesus' failure to observe purity boundaries, that's what they called them, purity boundaries between men and women, his failure to do this disqualifies him as a prophet. But Simon goes further, and this is where Simon overplays his hand. He soils the woman's reputation as well. He refers to the way the woman touches Jesus. The Greek verb in Luke 7 here is provocative. It can also mean light a fire. We could even translate it like this. Listen carefully. If Jesus were really a prophet, and he isn't, Simon is saying, he would know what sort of woman this is who is trying to turn him on. The triclinium and its guests are electrified by the tension. War has been declared by Simon. Jesus then tells a parable for everyone at the table to hear. And I imagine the crowd that is surrounding the table has stopped moving. You could hear a pin drop. Judaism has a long history of teachers telling parables when they are in a tight spot. Parables like this could not only give a bit of wisdom, but they could set up a story in which words of judgment were hidden. In this case, Jesus refers to two debtors. One is forgiven 50 denarii, that's about a month's wage, and another has been forgiven 500 denarii, about a year and a half's wage. And remarkably, a moneylender forgives both of them. Now, Jesus asks simply, which debtor would be more grateful? Rather than respond to Simon's hostility, Jesus now asks Simon to make one more judgment. Just as he has judged the woman, now he must judge the parable. Jesus does something dramatic. He turns and looks at the woman and he lectures the men. Notice he turns away from the table, turning his back to the men, looking at the woman and begins to talk to these guys. He recites the three things she has done, kissing, washing feet, anointing. The woman who is supposed to be a sinner has acted more graciously than Simon, who's supposed to be the righteous man. In a word, the woman's deeds have judged Simon's failure to act. So what does the parable say? The parable is Jesus' overture to the entire table. But in particular, Jesus is talking to Simon. If a person is forgiven little, say a month's wage, and another person is forgiven a lot, maybe 18 months wage, which one will have the more grateful response? Simon has met his prophet. He must now make a judgment which will inevitably contradict what he said before. Obviously, the person forgiven a lot will be more grateful. And this may include the woman. 
which means she has been the recipient of God's grace in abundance, which means something has transpired inside of her, and it ought to be recognized. Jesus commends Simon's right answer. The greater the debt, the greater the gratitude. Now, it's vital that we translate verse 47 correctly. This woman's sins are not forgiven because she has loved much, a thought that would mean she earned Jesus' favor, but rather, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, therefore she loves much. In other words, because she had been forgiven, she then shows love toward Jesus, which is exemplified in washing his feet with tears and anointing him with perfume. So let's finally recap the story. So here we have a dinner party filled with theologians, and Jesus has been invited and publicly shamed. A woman who no doubt heard his message about grace at some point in her life, a woman with a horrible reputation, turns up and rescues Jesus. And in the midst of all of this, we have a host named Simon who is hostile, so hostile. Then Jesus offers a parable about gratefulness and debt. He is the central character of the story, naturally. He is willing to go where risk is involved. He's even willing to have dinner with a circle of men who maybe debated him already in public in the village synagogue. He is also willing to be identified with people who live on the margin. People like this woman who enjoyed no respect from the town's religious leadership. In other words, Jesus' character of compassion and perseverance for sinners of all types, religious sinners like Simon included, this is absolutely stunning. I imagine Jesus loves Simon no less than the woman. This story reminds us that Jesus' compassion is wide. He is willing to extend his grace to any who invite him near. The religious, the irreligious, the powerful, the weak, people at the top or bottom of society, Jesus is interested in all of them. Everyone in a city as huge as the city of Chicago. When I walk around the streets of Chicago downtown, I think of people, some of whom are religious, some are irreligious, some see themselves as power brokers, others are not. And I wonder, when they step into the church, will they meet the Simons or will they meet Jesus? The second major character in the story, of course, is Simon. But above all, we must not stereotype a Pharisee like him. He loved the Bible. He was devout. I'm sure he was generous with his money. He attended worship regularly. He lived a life of purity and righteousness. And I'm sure that he was honored in his spiritual community. And yet there is something wrong. There was a cancer at work in his soul. At some point, Simon had lost touch with his need for forgiveness. His own self-assessment, I imagine, concluded that his life merited applause, and as a result, his life required little grace from God. This, I think, is what led inevitably to what we see at the dinner party. So Simon forces us to ask about our relationship to the grace of God, and it makes us wonder what happens to us when we've been saturated in a religious life for such a long time, when we have adopted the spiritual, cultural habits that we have for many, many years, and we no longer recognize our need for God's forgiveness. What happens when we become such religious people that we don't even think about the grace of God any longer? These are the sorts of questions that haunt us who live lives inside of Christian communities every day? Have we forgotten what it means to be forgiven? And if we have, will we begin to think and act like Simon? That's the important question. Will we forget to be equally gracious to those around us? See, Simon is the last man that I want to be like. He is religious. He is so religious. But he's also far from God. 
The third and last character in the story, of course, is the woman. The woman is a hero, not simply because she risks deep social misunderstanding when she rescues Jesus. She's a hero because in her heart is a deep treasury of humility. She has a horrid reputation, and yet she has experienced the grace of God in Christ. But I think there's a secret at the heart of this woman's life, and it's not told to us in the story. She has had contact with the grace of God, and maybe it was through the ministry of Jesus. We simply don't know. But she has been overcome by Jesus' willingness to love and forgive her despite her reputation. See, she is a woman in whom there is transparency, vulnerability, even openness. Her personal crisis became a gateway through which Jesus could step, and her deeds at the party were simply an expression of gratitude that she felt because of her personal renewal.